In this video, we'll be looking at a machine learning model called the Gaussian mixture model. So it seems like a pretty scary string of words, but it's not that tough. So we're going to be using the same framework that we used in previous machine learning model videos, where we have uh, the length and weight of a fish, and we're trying to determine whether it's a tuna or it's a salmon. So in this uh, example up here, all these orange triangles are salmon, so they have high length and high weight, let's say, and these uh, red circles are tuna. They have low length and low weight. But there's something more going on. They seem to be kind of um, in a certain shape. If we had to draw kind of a line around them, the salmon seems like more or less a circle, maybe a little bit elongated. They occur in that kind of form. And the tuna seem to be more elongated and the oval is more kind of diagonal. There seems to be something more going on than just some link between the length and the weight. So that's where the Gaussian mixture model comes in. This model assumes that our classes are distributed in a Gaussian distribution. If this word Gaussian is not familiar to you, you're more probably familiar with normal. So a normal distribution, which occurs all the time in statistics, it's that classic bell curve that everyone talks about. That's the same thing here, except this is in two dimensions. So you're saying here, I don't see any bell curve, anything like that. Um, so remember that bell curve is the probability density function of the normal distribution. This is simply just um, plotting the points, the length and weight, which are both assumed to be distributed normally in some way. So remember that our one dimensional normal distribution is driven by two parameters, mu, which is the mean, the center of the distribution, and sigma, which tells us how spread out is the distribution. So a high sigma would mean that it's very spread out, a low sigma would mean that it's pretty compact, right? So in the same way, when we have higher dimensions, um, probably you would want to study the multivariate normal distribution before going through this video, but in higher dimensions, it's the same form. We have a mu vector now, so here it's a two dimensional vector. The mu for salmon is probably something around there, the middle of that. The mu for tuna is probably something around there, the middle of that. And we have, instead of sigma, which is our uh, standard, standard deviation, we have a covariance matrix sigma, okay? So this is capital sigma. And this is a two by two matrix because we're in two dimensions. And it basically just tells us what's the shape of that oval. So is it more circular? Is it more of an oval? Is it tilted? Is it not tilted? That's what the entries of sigma basically tell us at a very high level, okay? So again, the Gaussian mixture model assumes that our classes, in this case, our two classes are salmon and tuna, our classes are distributed in a normal distribution in however many dimensions we have data for. Here we have two dimensions of data. So the goal is trying to figure out the best parameters. So the best mu, sigma, and there's another parameter called pi. And this one simply just tells us what's the probability of being in either class, uh, salmon or tuna. So we have these three sets of parameters, the pi's, the sigma's, and the mu's. The Gaussian mixture model tries to figure out the optimal values of these parameters to best fit our existing data. So that if a new data point comes in, um, I'm gonna say this is a new data point, Obviously, we think it goes to the salmon because it's really within that distribution. But based on the optimal parameters we find with our existing data, we should be able to mathematically determine that that new uh, point with its length and its weight should be in the salmon distribution. Okay, so that's at a high level how the Gaussian mixture model works. Let's go into some of the more math of it. So again, to break it down, it assumes that there's some tuna distribution, which is distributed normally with mu t, mu sub t is the mean for tuna, which again is probably something around there, and sigma sub t, which is the covariance matrix for the tuna normal distribution. We also assume that there's a salmon distribution with some other mean, mu sub s, and some other covariance matrix, uh, sigma sub s. This x, if you're wondering, is simply just the vector which tells us the length and the weight of any fish. So this line basically here means that uh, if I know that something is a tuna, then I know that it's distributed according to mu sub t and sigma sub t. And again, there's also these pi parameters, which basically tell us what's the probability that something is a tuna. That would be pi sub t. And probability that something is a salmon would be pi sub s. So these parameters together, mu, sigma, and pi, completely uh, describe our entire situation here. Now, how do we figure out these best parameters, right? That's our goal. Once we figure out these parameters, it'll be pretty easy to figure out whether a mystery thing is a salmon or a tuna. Well, we want to maximize a certain quantity, and that quantity is right here, this probability of x. So that means that if you give me a uh, basically all of these points right here, all of these tuna and all of these salmon, uh, 
I want to maximize the probability of seeing those examples um, given some mu, sigma, and pi. So that'll make a little more sense as we go through this example. So take one random observation, right? So if you have one observation x with its length and its weight, what's the probability of seeing observation x? Well, there's two cases. Either that observation was generated from the tuna distribution or the salmon distribution. So the probability of being generated from the tuna distribution is pi sub t. And if it was generated from the tuna distribution, then the probability of seeing that example would be the normal distribution of x, um, or basically the normal distribution of the tuna generating x. So that's what this means right here. That piece right here means that given that I'm uh, from the tuna generating distribution, what's the probability that I get this value x, okay? And I add that because I have a second case. I add that to the probability of something, of this thing being a salmon, times the probability that given I'm in the salmon generating distribution, the salmon generating normal distribution, that it generates this value x. So that's the probability of seeing observation x. And that is something I want to maximize because I truly did see observation x. In the real world, I was given this observation and it truly exists. So I want to tweak my parameters mu, sigma, and pi such that they give me the highest value of actually seeing this thing that really exists. Okay, so let's switch over to this piece of paper and continue that conversation. So again, how do we pick the best pi, mu, and sigma? That was a single observation, little x. Here is a big x, which is a n by d matrix, n being the number of points. So that's all of these salmon and all of these tuna, and d being the number of dimensions, which is two. Remember, we have just a length and a weight for each fish. So given that whole array of observations, given all of those fish with all of their lengths and all their weights, I want to maximize the probability of seeing all that data given the parameters I have, pi, mu, and sigma. So how do we have a more mathematical form for this? How do we expand this out? That's what's written on this line right here. And this is as mathy as we're going to get. Um, we'll see that if we truly want to maximize it, we're going to have to use some calculus. It's going to get pretty complicated, but we'll, we won't go into that. So before we talk about that, again, the probability of seeing this big X, all this data we have, given the pi, mu, and sigma that we currently have, is going to be, so this outer pi, if you're not familiar with this notation, this is simply like a sigma, except you multiply everything inside instead of add. So here we're going from n equals 1 to big N, which is all of the data points we have. So we're assuming they're all generated independently. Okay, that's one of the assumptions of this model. So each one, uh, the probability that we get for it is going to be multiplied together. That's what this pi means. So I'll put this is because of independence. Now for each data point, here now we're talking about any one specific data point in that set. We're basically just doing the calculation from the previous sheet of paper. So right here, remember the probability of seeing any individual observation x is simply just the sum of all of the different classes it can be in times the probability of seeing that observation given that you're in this class, which is just the normal distribution right here. So that's what this is doing. This is a more generalized form. Of course, for us, k is just two. So I could have just written two terms, but this is in general for big k classes. It's the probability that this observation is in that class, which is pi sub k, times, given that it's in that class, what's the probability of that specific normal generating distribution generating that point? So that's why we have this full form here. That's the probability of seeing the data we currently have, given this pi, mu, and sigma, okay? So before we go forward, what we're gonna do is define some auxiliary quantities, which will are, show up in our final solutions. Uh, Z sub n k is really simple. It's an indicator variable, which is one, if x sub n is in class k and zero if it's not. So just indicator. Uh, this Greek letter is gamma, if you're not familiar. So gamma of Z sub n k is simply just the probability that our observation is in class k. Okay, given our observation. So basically, if someone gives you a new observation, this mystery point right here with its given length and weight, uh, and says, what's the probability that it's a salmon or what's the probability it's a tuna? That is basically what gamma z sub n k, where k is either tuna or salmon. Okay, we can expand this out. This looks really scary, I agree. Um, but you can go ahead and prove this for yourself using Bayes' theorem. That's how we get all this stuff in red. But all the stuff in gray is just a different name if we have for it. For example, probability that zk equals one is simply just pi k because it's the probability that any observation uh, is in class k. That's just pi sub k. So we have a shorthand and 
another thing here is probability that given something is in class K, uh, that we see that observation would just be the normal distribution for class K generating that observation. And similarly for these terms down here. So go ahead and verify that for yourself if you'd like. And this uh, going from this step to this step is using Bayes' theorem. The last thing is n sub k is simply just the sum of gamma z n sub uh, z sub n k going from n equals one to n. Okay. So these are some auxiliary quantities. You're probably wondering what's the point of defining them. So the point of defining them is that uh, basically what we're doing here, we want to maximize this probability, right? How do you maximize things in math? You take the derivative. So this is where it gets complicated, but basically you can think of it as we're taking the derivative of this whole thing, uh, basically with respect to pi sub k, with respect to mu sub k, and respect to sigma sub k separately, and setting those equal to zero. And then we're solving for the optimal uh, mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k. And when we do that, this is what we get. So maximizing this guy with respect to all these parameters right here gives us these three formulas for the optimal mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k. And now you see why we had to define those quantities because they show up all the time. Here's n sub k, here's the gammas, for example. So they're showing up all the time in here. That's why we needed to define them, okay? So basically, this is all very complicated and you can go into it more if you want. There's many resources out there for all the math. You can go through it, verify it for yourself. But uh, at a high level, what we need to notice is that the formulas for mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k, that is these three up here, only depend on this gamma, right? Because here we see that uh, we would need to know this gamma here. We would need to know this gamma here. This n sub k, you say, oh, that does that depend on gamma? Uh, well, if we look at this, this n sub k indeed just depends on gamma. So if we know the gammas, we already know mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k. Also, this gamma, let's look at the formula for that gamma, which is right here, that only depends on the pi sub k's, the mu, uh, mu sub k's and sigma sub k's. So they kind of depend on each other. That is, if we have the gammas, we can calculate these three guys. And if we have these three guys, we can calculate the gammas. So it seems like a circular dependency. But another way to think about it is just a formulation for an algorithm to find the best values for our parameters. And that algorithm is called the expectation maximization or EM algorithm. And it's just three simple steps. The first one is we initialize mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k to some values that make sense, whatever initial values we want. Next, remember that if we have these, we can successfully calculate our gammas. So we go ahead and calculate our gammas in step two. Now that we have our gammas, remember we can recalculate these three parameters here because we had some initial values for them, but with our gammas, those values are going to change a little bit or a lot. So in step three, we recompute mu sub k, sigma sub k, and pi sub k. Now that we have new values for these guys, we can basically just repeat, right? We can recalculate our gammas. And then now that we have new gammas, we can recalculate these guys. So we can go again and again and again and again, right? And you're basically asking, when do I stop? Well, there's different stopping criteria you can set. One would be these parameters converge to something. Um, you could also say that the function you're trying to maximize, for example, this function right here, that converges to some maximum, or you can set up some other stop and criteria altogether, just do a thousand or 10,000 iterations. So anything that makes sense to you, okay? But that's what the EM algorithm is. And I should say that, so step two is the E step, the expectation step. And then step three is the maximization step, because in that step, we're picking the parameters which maximize our function. Okay, so that is basically how the Gaussian mixture model works. At the end of that, we have our best values for mu, sigma, and pi, which hopefully match up to these visual distributions we see in our data set, okay? And another question you're probably wondering is, why is the Gaussian mixture model useful? It was so much work, it was so much math, it's probably computationally pretty expensive. Um, well, something we saw in k-means is that k-means is um, problematic when the clusters are of very different sizes. Just for example, let's see if I have room on any of these papers. Maybe I can just draw it right here. Uh, if we had an example like this, where there's a small Gaussian, a small, norm, small normal distribution right here, and there's a massive normal distribution right here, k-means might have issues because one of the implicit assumptions of k-means is that your clusters are of uh, about the same size. But Gaussian mixture model, because it's literally searching for these Gaussian distributions, will do a much better job of locating these clusters, even when 
they are of different sizes. Okay, so it really just depends on what's your setup um, and what are the specifics of your problem. But anyway, that's Gaussian mixture model in a nutshell. So until next time.